We'll turn your Bibles, please, to the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter 37. Genesis is the first book in the Bible, easiest one to find. And just move 37 chapters in, you'll find where we are today. Um, We're starting a new series of sermons on the life of Joseph, one of the most intriguing characters in the Bible, really an amazing story. We're going to be looking at his story over the next few weeks. And we've entitled the series of sermons, Overcome, right? Just Overcome, because Joseph, I think, is an amazing example of somebody who overcome overcame amazing challenges, amazing op- obstacles in the strength of God, and God used him greatly as a result. And uh, uh, we want to learn some lessons uh, from his life as we think about our own, ch- our own challenges and our own difficulties. And so today we're going to look at the challenges of overcoming uh, a dysfunctional family, and maybe some of you can relate to that. We'll talk about that today. So let's bow our heads in prayer as we give our time to the Lord today. Father, um, thank you for your word. Thank you for the practicality of it. Uh, thank you that uh, we can call you Father and, and know that you care for us and love us. And so, Lord, we pray that as our Father, you would speak to our hearts this morning through your word. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, how many of you like HGTV? Any HGTV fans here today? All right, I think that was about the, the best $6 a month I spent. LV loves HGTV. I enjoy watching it. And if you spent any amount of time watching HGTV, then you know that most of the individuals and most of the families that are hiring these architects and these designers to do their homes, they're all looking for the open concept, right? How many times have you heard that on HGT? We really want the open concept. And what is the open concept? It's a, it's a, it's a kitchen that, that opens up out onto the living room and the dining room where everybody can get together as one big happy family and all can be in one big space. You can have parties and it's this great thing. Everybody today wants the open concept. But if all you watch is HGTV, you may not be aware that there's a competing floor plan and another concept that uh, isn't designed for big happy families like the ones you see on HGTV, it's designed for dysfunctional families. Uh, let me read to you an article that appeared a couple of years back in the Wall Street Journal. This is by June Fletcher, and the article is entitled, The Dysfunctional Family House, okay? The Ledbetter family likes to spend time at home together, just not in the same room. So they built a 3,600-square-foot house with special rooms for studying and sewing, separate sitting areas for each kid, and a master bedroom far from both. Then there's the escape room, where Mr. Ledbetter says, quote, any family member can go to get away from the rest of us. The Mercer Island, Washington industrial designer says his 7- and 11-year-old daughters fight less because their new house gives them so many ways to avoid each other. Quote, it just doesn't make sense for us to do everything together all the time, he says. After two decades of pushing the open floor plan, where domestic life revolved around a big central space and exposed kitchens gave everyone a view of half the house, major builders and top architects are walling people off. They're touting one-person internet alcoves, locked door away rooms, and his and her offices on opposite ends of the house. The new floor plans offer so much seclusion, they're good, quote, for the dysfunctional family, says Gopal Alwalia director of research for the National Association of Home Builders. Uh, The approach isn't for all architects. William Sherman, chairman of the Department of Architecture and Landscape Architecture at the University of Virginia, says all these cut up spaces make families more isolated and lonelier than ever. Quote, people don't even gather in the same spot to watch TV anymore. It's sad, he said. And it is kind of sad when you think about that, right? And yet, it's sort of a commentary on the time in which we live, right? It's almost harder to find healthy families nowadays than it is to find dysfunctional families. And we could decry that reality. We could try to explore all the reasons for that. But the fact is, it's it's really nothing new, okay? Dysfunctional families are as old as humanity itself. And we see a pretty good example of that in the passage of Scripture we're looking at today, the family of Jacob, Thousands of years ago, we see in living color in the pages of Scripture a family that knew its share of dysfunction, and we're going to learn from them today. Notice in Genesis chapter 37, verse 1, now Jacob lived in the land where his father had sojourned in the land of Canaan. These are the records of the generations of Jacob. Let me just pause and say that Jacob was a very important character in the Bible story. Um, Jacob actually had his name changed to Israel, and it was after him that the nation of Israel got its name. Uh, Jacob was the son of Isaac. He was the grandson of Abraham, the father of the Jewish nation. He came from a very important family, but it was also a very dysfunctional family. And as we're going to see today, Jacob perpetuated that dysfunction in his own family, 
And we're going to see that this morning. Now, you may be thinking, Brent, why are we taking the time today to study a dysfunctional family that lived thousands of years ago? What's the point of that? And, and the purpose really is twofold. Number one, it's so that in Jacob's family, maybe we could see some similarities with our own family. Maybe we could begin to recognize some of the dysfunction in our own families. But number two, and more importantly, that we might learn how to respond to our dysfunctional families in a way that honors the Lord, right? So let's talk first about recognizing the dysfunction in our families. Um, in our effort to recognize this, we see here four elements that are oftentimes characteristic in dysfunctional families. We see these in the life of jo Jacob's family. We see them in our families. The first of them is this, inconsistency. And here I'm speaking primarily of inconsistency on the part of the parents. And we see two elements of this. First of all is an inconsistent leadership. Now, Jacob had a very rich history with God. Jacob was a unique individual in that he was the sole person in all of human history who has the distinction of being the one person who literally wrestled with God and lived to tell the tale, right? He had face-to-face -to -face encounters and conversations with God. And on at least one occasion, we know that he did talk to his sons about that, but apparently he did little more than talk. His talk never translated into real meaningful affection or leadership or discipline or spiritual direction in his son's lives. He was a very selfish person and a largely passive father. And I'd like to share with you just a couple examples of that in Jacob's life from other passages of the Scripture. I'll just describe these for you, but the first one is found in Genesis chapter 34 where one of Jacob's daughters, his daughter Dinah, was raped by the prince of the city called Shechem. And rather than pursuing justice for his daughter, rather than at the very least providing for her, for his humiliated daughter, you know what Jacob did? He did nothing. He did nothing. And because he did nothing, two of his sons, Simeon and Levi, decided to do something. They decided to take matters into their own hands. They said, in effect, listen, if dad's not going to deal with this, we will. And, and through a, 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 an amazing story in Genesis 34, what Jacob's two sons did in retaliation for this act of humiliation against their sister, they, they killed the prince of Shechem, they launched a brutal massacre in retaliation, killing every man in that entire city, plundering their houses, ravaging their wives, stealing crops and livestock. I mean, they went way beyond justice. They went into all-out revenge and retaliation mode. And what did Jacob do? Again, he did nothing. He simply told his sons in Genesis 34, 30, and I quote, you have brought trouble on me by making me odious among the inhabitants of the land. They will gather together against me and attack me, and I will be destroyed, I and my household. No mention here of the fact that what they did was unspeakably wrong, shedding innocent blood, making them really more guilty than those they were trying to punish. No mention of that. Jacob's only concern here is for himself. He's angry, not that his sons had, had committed an unthinkable crime, but rather that he was now going to be in trouble, right? His neighbors were now going to be mad at him and give him a hard time. Notice what his sons said to him in Genesis 34, 31. They said, should he treat our sister as a harlot? Are you going to let the prince of Shechem get away with that? They told him in essence, dad, you didn't handle the problem, so we did. And parents, I think there's a lesson here. If, if we don't lead in our homes, somebody will. Right? If there's a leadership vacuum in our home, somebody's going to step into that vacuum. It may be, well be your children. Right? It's not a matter of if there will be a leader in the home. It's a question of who. And for the sake of your kids, that who better be you. That better be us as parents. Let me give you another example of Jacob's inconsistent leadership. Here we see an example of, 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 of really poor relationships. Um, Jacob had two wives. Okay, that's a problem. Uh, further complicating the problem is those two wives were both sisters. Okay, that's a problem. On top of that, he had two mistresses, two concubines. That's a problem, right? And, and why would a man do this? Well, clearly because he's, it's just his own satis satisfying his own selfish desires. But in so doing, think about the, the strange intertwined web of, web of relationships that he created in that home between sisters and wives and concubines and stepfathers and stepmothers and, and full brothers and half brothers. And as you can well imagine, the tension in that home was so thick you could cut it with a knife. That home was just perpetually marked by conflict and anger and tension. We see it in the book of Genesis. And at one point, the oldest son, Reuben, actually committed fornication with one of his father's concubines. And, and what did Jacob do? He did nothing. Um, 
But then again, what can you do when your son is being immoral with the woman you're being immoral with? I mean, it is so messed up. Jacob was a walking contradiction. He miserably failed to model for his sons a consistent godly walk. He perpetuated in his home this inconsistent leadership. Secondly, inconsistent love. Notice Genesis 37 verse 2. Joseph, when 17 years of age, was pastoring the flock with his brothers while he was still a youth, along with the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought back a bad report about them, his brothers, to their father. Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his sons because he was the son of his old age, and he made him a very colored tunic. Now we see two things about Joseph right off the bat here. Number one, he's a bit of a tattletale, right? He's out there and he comes back with a bad report about his brothers. He's telling on his brothers. Number two, Joseph is not only a tattletale, he's also a daddy's boy. Right? He is clearly Jacob's favorite. It says, Jacob, Israel, loved him more than his sons. And as a result, as an expression of that favoritism, he, he made him a very colored tunic. Um, in the Hebrew language, it, it literally says not a coat of many colors, but a coat of many pieces. Or as hum, some Hebrew scholars translate it, a tunic with sleeves. Okay? Uh, Griffith Thomas is a commentator, and I like what he says in this regard in his commentary on the book of Genesis. Let me just read this to you. He says, the gift of a coat of many pieces, not colors, or rather the tunic with sleeves, was about the most significant act that Jacob could have shown to Joseph. It was a mark of distinction that carried its own meaning, for it implied that exemption from labor which was the peculiar privilege of the heir or prince of the eastern clan. Instead of the ordinary workaday vestment which had no sleeves and which by coming down to the knees only enabled men to set about their work, this tunic with sleeves clearly marked out its wearer as a, personal, a, a person of special distinction who is not required to do ordinary work, right? And as we'll see in this story, when normally when Joseph's older brothers were out doing work in the field, where was Joseph? He was at home with daddy, right? He got special gifts, he wore special clothes, he got special treatment, and, and, and Jacob's favoritism towards Joseph created tremendous tension and hardship in that home. And again, I think there's a lesson for us as parents. Um, parents, we won't treat our kids all the same in one sense, right? Because our kids aren't the same. They have different personalities. They have different strengths and weaknesses. And, and so naturally, you'll relate to ch different children differently. And, and they may, you may have one child that's a little bit closer to your personality and it's easier to communicate. That's natural. There's some things that are just natural where, where some children may be more uh, responsible and you can trust them with more privileges. So in one sense, you don't treat all your children the same because they're not all the same. But there is a very important respect in which we must treat our children equally, and that's when it comes to our love for them, right? There must always be an unshakable foundation of unconditional love that is lavished equally upon our children, and they have to feel that. They have to know that. Because when there isn't that equal kind of love, that kind of inconsistency leads, secondly, to insecurity. Notice verse 4. Joseph's brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers. You know what? Our kids aren't stupid, Okay? They know when they're getting the short end of the stick. We can tell them we love them all we want, but if they sense favoritism in the way we treat them or another sibling, um, they'll figure out very quickly where they rank on that totem pole, right, in that family, and, and that will create with them in them a sense of underlying insecurity, which will lead to the third thing, and that's insensitivity. When there's not this security of consist consistent, unconditional love, it creates in that home a sort of every man for himself mentality, where instead of pulling together, you all kind of have to feel like you have to defend yourself and protect your own interests and sometimes attack other people to kind of keep your own equal footing, right? And that's what happened in Joseph's family. Verse 4, his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, and so they hated him and could not speak to him on friendly terms. Now, the irony is Jacob thought he was blessing Joseph with this special kind of treatment. In fact, he was making his life and everybody's life far more difficult. Jo J Jacob was introducing a tension and conflict into that home through that favoritism. A and let's be honest, Joseph himself is not without some blame. Notice how he behaved in verse 5. Then Joseph had a dream. And when he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. And he said to them, please listen to this dream which I have had. For behold, we were binding sheaves, bundles of grain in the field, and lo, my sheaf, sheaf rose up and also stood erect. 
And behold, your sheaves gathered around and bowed down to my sheaf. Right? And there's clearly some symbolism here. And, and his brothers recognized it. Verse 8, his brothers said to him, are you actually going to reign over us? Or are you really going to rule over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. So Joseph says, hey, let me tell you this great dream, and it's indicative of the fact that one day you guys are going to serve me. <laughs> they had to take kindly to that. Um, you'd think Joseph would have learned his lesson, but he did it a second time. Notice verse 9. Now he had still another dream and related it to his brothers and said, lo, I have had still another dream. And behold, the sun and the moon and 11 stars were bowing down to me. And he related to his father and to his brothers, and his father rebuked him and said to him, what is this dream that you've had? Shall I and your mother and your brothers actually come to bow ourselves down before you to the ground? And his brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the saying in mind. So these are dreams that, again, all of them in their own way, kind of point to the fact that Joseph's the number one guy and everybody around him kind of bows around him and his brothers are going, man, what a narcissist, right? Be, be quiet. What are you talking about, right? They didn't take kindly to these dreams and Joseph is sort of stepping up here. And, and you know, the irony is these were God-given dreams, okay? As we're going to see, there was a prophetic element to these dreams, these very things would happen. There will come a time in the story when Joseph, in fact, will rise to a position of prominence and his family members will bow down before him. But nonetheless, you have to question the wisdom of Joseph in, in sort of spouting these dreams and sharing them with these brothers who are already jealous of him. At worst, it's, it's the height of arrogance. At best, it's just a lack of discernment, right? To throw fuel on the flames of what is already a tense situation. But what we see here is this kind of insensitivity. And every man for himself kind of thing where nobody really cares about the feelings of others, right? You treat me badly, I'm going to take a pot shot at you. And we see this dynamic going on in, in Joseph's family. Joseph would have been much better to do what Mary did when she received a vision from God. The Bible says Mary pondered these things in her heart, right? <laughs> that would have been a better course for Joseph just to kind of keep these things inside and remember them. But Joseph and his brothers demonstrated a lack of sensitivity to one another. And this kind of insensitivity leads fourthly to isolation where the family's divided, where now there's distance between the members of this family. Um, let me read Genesis 37, 12 and following. It's a lengthy passage, but let me read it and just sort of comment along the way. Verse 12, then his brothers went to pasture their father's flock in Shechem. And remember, Shechem was the city where the prince raped their sister, the very city where they had gone back and done a complete massacre in that city. And so now Jacob is a little nervous about his sons going back to this area. They're, they're, they're taking care of their flocks near the city. Uh, I think Jacob may have been concerned that something bad is going to go down again in Shechem. And so verse 13 says, Israel, Jacob, said to Joseph, are not your brothers pasturing the flock in Shechem? Come and I will send you to them. And he said to him, I will go. Then he said to him, go now and see about the welfare of your brothers and the welfare of the flock and bring word back to me. So he sent him from the valley of Hebron and he came to Shechem. Um, Jacob again wanted to make sure that nothing bad was going to happen again like it did in Shechem before and so he sent Joseph to check up on them. Here again we see Joseph sort of plays the little watchdog, the little tattletale in the family. That's sort of his role. Verse 15, a man found Joseph and behold he was wandering in the field and the man asked him, what are you looking for? And he said, I'm looking for my brothers. Please tell me where they are pasturing their flock. Then the man said, they have moved from here, for I heard them say, let us go to Dothan. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them in, at Dothan. When they saw him from a distance, and before he came close to them, they plotted against him to put him to death. The moment they see their little brother Joseph on the horizon, they recognize him immediately, probably from the flowing tunic that he was wearing, that special favored tunic he was wearing, and, and, and they're so hateful towards him, they're so angry about him, that, that as they see him on that horizon, they immediately begin saying, hey, it's just us and him, nobody's going to know, let's kill him. Verse 19, they said to one another, here comes this dreamer. Now then, come and let us kill him and throw him into one of the pits. And we will say, a wild beast devoured him. Then let us see what will become of his dreams. But Reuben, and Reuben's the oldest brother, Reuben heard this and rescued him out of their hands and said, let us not take his life. Reuben further said to them, shed no blood, throw him into this pit that is in the wilderness, but do not lay hands on him that he might rescue him out of their hands to restore him to his father. Reuben knew that if anything happened to beloved Joseph, 
daddy would take it out on him as the oldest brother. He knew that he'd be held responsible, but he also knew what his brothers were like, right? He'd seen what they do to people in Shechem, and he didn't really want to cross them, and so he found himself in this tense situation. He said, hey guys, how about we not kill him, just throw him in the pit, and his intent was to come back later and rescue him out of the pit, right? Um, Verse 23, so it came about when Joseph reached his brothers that they stripped Joseph of his tunic the multicolored tunic that was on him. And notice the first thing they went after was that symbol of privilege, that symbol of favoritism. They strip it off of him and they took him and threw him into the pit. Now the pit was empty without any water in it. And that's significant because had there been water in this pit, it was a cistern, really it was a well, um, Joseph would have probably drowned pretty quickly. Um, This in its own way was God's providence looking out for Joseph. It probably was a pretty good tumble, but a bruised some ribs and scraped himself up hitting that dry cistern, but nonetheless God spared him. God was looking out for him even in the pit. Um, Verse 25, then they sat down to eat a meal. Now think about the gall of this, right? Poor little Joseph is crying for help, desperately pleading for his life in that pit. They can still hear the echo of his cries, and they're sitting around going, hey, pass the mutton. Anybody got mustard? You know, they're they're just eating like nothing happened. The hard-heartedness. And as they raised their eyes and looked, behold, a caravan of Ishmaelites was coming from Gilead with their camels bearing aromatic gum and balm and myrrh on their way down to bring them to Egypt. And Judah said to his brothers, what profit is it for us to kill our brother and cover up his blood? Come and let us sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay our hands on him, for he is our brother, our very own flesh. How noble of him, right? And his brothers listened to him. Verse 28, then some Midianite traders passed by, so they pulled him up and lifted Joseph out of the pit. And just imagine how Joseph's heart must have soared when he saw that rope being lowered down from the bit. He thought, okay, my brothers were just joking. Okay, everything is good now. They're helping me. They're rescuing me. And he comes over to the edge of that, that pit only to see a band of foreigners, slave traders with shackles in their hands, and they clamped those shackles on him, right? And they sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 shekels of silver. Then they brought Joseph into Egypt. Now Reuben returned to the pit, and behold, Joseph was not in the pit. So he tore his garments, and he returned to his brothers and said, the boy is not there. As for me, where am I to go? Okay, apparently Reuben hadn't been here when they sold him to the Ishmaelites. His plan was to come back, rescue him, but when he goes back, Joseph's not there, Suddenly he knows, I'm going to be in trouble with dad. What happened? Verse 31, so they took Joseph's tunic and slaughtered a male goat and dipped the tunic in the blood. And they sent the multicolored tunic and brought it to their father and said, "Uh, we found this. Please examine it to see whether it is your son's tunic or not. Then he examined it and said, it is my son's tunic. A wild beast has devoured him. Joseph has surely been torn to pieces. And so, you know, these brothers may well have prided themselves in the fact that they didn't actually lie to their dad, right? They just kind of created this little false evidence, handed it to dad, and let him kind of draw his own false conclusions, but make no mistake, they deceived their father. Verse 34, so Jacob tore his clothes and put sackcloth on his loins and mourned for his son many days. Then all his sons and all his daughters arose to comfort him. You know, how disingenuous. But he refused to be comforted, and he said, Surely I will go down to Sheol in mourning for my son. So his father wept for him. Meanwhile, the Midianites sold him in Egypt to Potiphar, Pharaoh's officer, the captain of the bodyguard. You know, Jacob's inconsistency created insecurity in that family, which spawned insensitivity, which resulted in this kind of painful isolation. Now Joseph is hundreds of miles away from his family, separated from the family that he knows Jacob and his remaining sons are now distanced from one another because Jacob is overwhelmed by his grief and and it's just created this awful tension, this isolation where the family is is now no longer uh, living in harmony in any way. And uh, again, parents, I think there's a lesson here that's, that's for us. If we fail to provide consistent love and leadership in the home, we are sowing the seeds of dysfunction which will ultimately result in this kind of isolation. And as we look at this downward spiral, And as we recognize these elements of dysfunction in the home, I think we can see as parents the important role that we play in leading our families here, can't we? Now, I want to pause and say this. If if your kids maybe aren't walking with the Lord, or if your kids aren't growing up to be responsible adults, or if they have struggles or challenges, that isn't necessarily your fault as a parent, okay? I want to say that very clearly. Um, There are no guarantees in parenting. Perfect parenting does not guarantee perfect children. You know how I know that? 
Because we have a perfect parent, don't we? Our Heavenly Father. He's the perfect parent, but I can tell you what, we're all pretty screwed up kids, aren't we? <laughs> we, we all have our own problems, at least I do, right? Because perfect parenting doesn't guarantee perfect children, and there's a reason for that. It's because of free will, right? You can do everything right by your kids, and yet your kids can still choose to, to go their own path. That's, that's the nature of it, right? And so what I don't want to do is, is draw this one-to-one -one connection that if, if kids have problems, it's the parent's fault. That may not necessarily be the case, but, but what we do see here is that there is a key role that we play in our children's lives that can't be denied, right? We do have an important role to play in, in our children's lives, and, and Jacob failed in that regard, right? We have a responsibility as parents to give our children every spiritual advantage to be the people God called them to be, to guide them, to nurture them, to love them well, and Jacob failed. He provided inconsistent leadership and inconsistent love. He provided no moral guidance, no real meaningful boundaries to their children. And sadly, many times as parents, we make the same mistakes. Many times we take the, the, the path of least resistance, the easy path, the passive path. We, we, we don't want to fight that battle of the wills, right? Uh, we don't want to be seen as uncool or mean, and so we just sort of let our children kind of find their own way while we do our own thing. I like this article I ran across a few years ago. It was written by a grown child who'd grown up in a, in a home. This is what this person says. We had the meanest parents in the whole world. While other kids ate candy for breakfast, we had to have cereal, eggs, and toast. When others had a Pepsi and a Twinkie for lunch, we had to eat sandwiches. And you can guess, our parents fixed us a dinner that was different than other kids had too. Our parents insisted on knowing where we were at all times. You'd think we were convicts in a prison. They had to know who our friends were and what we were doing with them. They insisted that if we said we would be gone for an hour, we would be gone for an hour or less. We're ashamed to admit it now, but they had the nerve to break child labor laws, making us work. We had to wash the dishes, make the beds, learn to cook, vacuum the floor, do laundry, and all sorts of cruel jobs. I think they would lay awake at night thinking of more things for us to do. They always insisted on, telling, on us telling the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. By the time we were teenagers, they could read our minds, and life really got tough. They wouldn't let our friends just honk the horn when they showed up. They had to come up to the door so they could meet them. While everyone else was dating and they were 12 years old, we had to wait. Because of our parents, we missed out on a lot of things other kids experienced as well. None of us have ever been caught shoplifting, vandalizing others' property, or ever arrested for a crime. It was all their fault. We never got drunk, took up smoking, stayed out all night, or a million other things other kids did. Sundays were reserved for church, and we never missed once. We knew better than to ask to spend the night with a friend on Saturdays. Now that we've left home, we are all God-fearing, educated, honest adults. We are doing our best to be mean parents just like our parents were. The world just doesn't have enough mean parents anymore. <laughs> and I would agree with the general sentiment of that. And again, we don't mean to suggest necessarily that if our children struggle or experience any of these things, that it's the parents' fault. We've made that point. But I think as parents, we do recognize that we, have, we do have a responsibility to be consistent in our leadership and our love, to provide boundaries for our children in love, to make sure that we're not being passive parents like Jacob was, but instead proactively guiding them to a productive, God-honoring life, pointing them to Jesus Christ. Well, as we've made our way through this list, uh, it may well be that some of you are looking at your own families and going, yeah, I see a little bit of that in my family. I can see some of these elements in, in, in my upbringing in the world that I grew up in. Well, we don't want to stop there. The point isn't here just to make ourselves feel bad and see all the things that may be messed up about our homes. Um, we all have them. Uh, we not only want to recognize family dysfunction, but more importantly, we want to learn how to respond to it. How do we respond to it in, in a godly way? How do we respond to maybe the dysfunctional upbringing that some of us experienced? Well, let me suggest three principles in closing. Number one, love the family God gave you. Love the family God gave you. Um, in Exodus chapter 20 and other places throughout the Bible, remember God said, honor your father and mother. It's one of the Ten Commandments. And, and even if you had bad parents, um, you have to figure out a way to do that. How are you going to honor your parents? How are you going to love them well, even with all their flaws? Uh, Jesus said, you shall love your neighbor as you love yourself. He said that in a number of places. He said that's one of the two greatest commandments in all the Bible. And, and that command to love people includes members of your dysfunctional family right? They're not exempt. You may say, well, we, we don't really get along. We have kind of an adversarial relationship. Well, okay then. Remember what Jesus said in Luke chapter 6, love your enemies. <laughs> Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. And again, Joseph is an amazing example of this, this spirit. 
Um, again, I don't want to give away too much of the story, but as we study his story in the coming weeks, what we're going to see is that there would come an opportunity when Joseph had it within his power to retaliate against his brothers for the injustice and the wickedness that had been done against him. They tried to kill him. They sold him into slavery, right? And there came a time when Joseph had the opportunity to exact his pound of flesh and to exact revenge. And you know what Joseph did? He refused to pursue revenge. He chose intentionally to forgive and to love. And so must we. We must learn how to forgive and to love our families. Now, this doesn't mean that we just take all the painful things that have been done to us and just sort of sweep them under the rug and pretend they never happened. It doesn't mean that we just stuff our pain and our emotions deep inside of us. That's a recipe for disaster. If you've experienced pain in your past from a dysfunctional family, you may need to get some help processing that pain. You may need to talk to a trusted friend or, or a pastor or see a professional counselor. There's no shame in that whatsoever. That can be incredibly healthy and life-giving. Forgiving and loving doesn't mean you don't get the help you need. Nor does it mean that you don't ever talk to those members of your family about the pain that they've caused you. At the right time, in the right spirit, under the right circumstances, you may need to bring some things out into the open so that there can be an opportunity for healing and reconciliation. And let me just say this. As we talk about dysfunctional families, there are different levels of that. And I, I have to say this. If you're experiencing physical or sexual abuse in your family... Forgiving and loving does not mean that you keep that a secret and continue to endure that abuse. If you are being abused, you need to get out of that abusive environment. You need to seek a place of, of safety, a shelter. You need to call law enforcement. What your abuser is doing to you is not only wrong, it's not only immoral, it's illegal. And Romans chapter 13 tells us that God has given law enforcement to us for our protection. Let me say, well, you know what? Um, Calling the cops and a family member doesn't feel like a very loving thing to do. In fact, it may be the most loving thing you can do. Because people who engage in ongoing physical and sexual abuse will rarely stop until there's a significant intervention of some kind, until their secret is brought out into the open. It is only then that there's any hope of them truly changing and overcoming their sinful patterns and becoming the person God's called them to be. And I wish I didn't have to begin with all these disclaimers, but dysfunctional families get messy. They do, right? And, and, and I think it's important that we define what we don't mean when we talk about loving and forgiving our families. It doesn't mean that we just sweep everything under the rug. It doesn't mean that some tough things may not need to be dealt with. But what it does mean is that in your heart, you are making the conscious choice, the conscious decision not to let your past pain define you today. It's a choice not to let your pain embitter you or harden you or anger you against your family. It means that you refuse to hold grudges, that you choose instead to extend forgiveness and grace. It means that you find a way to honor your parents, however flawed they may be. It means that you express your gratitude in whatever ways you can, however small or insignificant. It means that you pray for your family, that you look for opportunities to bless your family. It means that in your heart you extend love to your family. And some of you may be saying, Brent, <laughs> you're asking me to love some really unlovable people. Yes, I am. And you know what? We're never more like Jesus than when we do that. We're never more like Christ than when we love people who are unlovable. Because Romans 5.8 reminds us that God demonstrated His love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Right? While we were still sinners... While we were actively breaking God's laws, rebelling against Him, while we were running as far and as fast from God as we could, He chased us all the way to the bloody cross. And He paid for our sins there. He suffered the equivalent of hell for you and me. And He rose from the dead so that by His Spirit, He could change us and empower us and make us the people He's called us to be. One day, He's coming back to make all things right. And I think one of the beauties of heaven is that our dysfunction will be gone, Right? Family members will be there, but it will be a place of peace and harmony and joy. We'll be the best version of ourselves. And this is what God promises. This is the hope of the gospel. And Jesus provided all of this for us, and He promises all of this to us, even though we're still sinners. He loves us not because we're lovable, not because we deserve His love, but because it is in His nature to love. And that's the kind of love that He calls on us to extend to others. What Jesus did for us on the cross and through His burial and resurrection and His, His second return, all that that He provides for us, it's a gift. He doesn't give it to us because we've paid for it or we've proved ourselves worthy of it. He gives it to us in spite of us, not because of us. 
All we can do is humbly receive it and say, God, will you forgive me? Will you save me? Will you come into my life? And when we do that, guess what? We now no longer have to run from God in fear. We can run to Him as our loving Heavenly Father. This is what He did for us. He loved us when we were unlovable. And it's only when we have experienced that kind of radical love and grace and forgiveness in our lives that we'll ever have any hope of beginning extending it to others. And so if you've never received Christ as your Savior, if you've never received His forgiveness, let me invite you and encourage you to do that. That is the only hope that you have of breaking free from some of this stuff. It is the only hope you have of finding it within your heart to be able to extend to others the radical forgiveness and grace that God's shown to us. Love the family that God gave you. Secondly, learn the lessons God has for you. Again, I don't want to tell too much of the story here, but as we'll see in the coming weeks, Joseph ultimately ended up as the second most powerful man in all of Egypt. God would use Joseph and his wisdom and his leadership to literally save the lives of millions of people all throughout the world. Joseph had tremendous power and leadership, and yet, as we'll see in this story, God could have never used him in that capacity had he not learned some valuable lessons along the way. Joseph never would have ended up in that position of prominence had, had these trials and these struggles and this dysfunction and the pain that he experienced not taken him there. It was the only way through and it was the only way that God could use him as he did. God used these pains and these trials and these challenges of his dysfunctional upbringing to mold him and to shape him and to strengthen him to make him the person he needed to be so that he could do what God needed him to do in this very powerful way. And the reality is God puts you in your family for a reason painful as it is. He has a purpose for that. And I'm not suggesting that God is the cause of, 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 of the evil and the abuse and whatever pain you may have experienced, but the beauty of the gospel is that we serve a God who, even though He doesn't cause these things, He can turn them upside down and redeem them for our good. He can use the pain in our life to, to forge within us the fair character of Christ and to make us the people He's called us to be and to give us amazing opportunities for Him. And so my challenge to you is this, even if you've experienced pain, pain of a a dysfunctional family, pain of a difficult upbringing, um, recognize there are lessons packaged within that pain, lessons that God wants you to learn, character that He wants to forge in you to make you more like Christ. He has great things planned for you. Um, Joseph could never have been the man he had become had it not been for that dysfunctional family. Those, Those things were a direct result of the man he became, right? Learn the lessons God has for you. Thirdly, live the life God called you to. And I think the reason God gave Joseph these sort of strange dreams as a young man um, is that he wanted to demonstrate, Joseph, um, there's some great things coming for you one day. I have plans for you. I have good purposes for you. And I think God wanted Joseph to see that so that as he went through these trials, he could keep that vision firmly in mind. He could remember that God is working towards his good and towards his purposes in his life right? And, and, and you and I, we may not have the benefit of those kinds of, you know, heavenly angelic visions or dreams. God may not give us to, those things to us, but you know what? We don't need that because we have the assurance of the written Word of God. In Romans eight twenty eight, it says, we know that God causes all things to work together for the good of those that love Him, for those who are called according to His purpose. Um, God has good plans and good purposes for our lives as well. We know that God causes all things to work together for the good of those who love Him. All things, the good, the bad, the ugly, the painful, the horrific, the wonderful, God wraps it all together and He takes it and He he creates something beautiful and He he produces something good. God has good purposes and plans for us, but you know what? We will never see His good purposes and His good plans for us in the future if we're constantly stuck in the past, right? And so let me just address a couple of groups in this room. First of all, parents. There may well be some parents in this room who as you look at Jacob, you're like, man, I look an awful lot like Jacob. I made a lot of those same mistakes. And, and, and as you look back at your failures, maybe as a parent, you, your heart could be filled with regret. You could be fill, filled with guilt and shame, right? And, and you could just wallow in that and you could get stuck in that and nothing good will come from that. Or you could be honest with God and you could say, God, thank you for showing me where I've failed as a father. Thank you for showing me where I've failed as a spouse or a husband or a wife. God, I just want to come clean and, and own that and say, I did fail you. I did sin against you. I failed my family. God, will you, will you forgive me? Can you cleanse me of that? Can you, can you grant me forgiveness for that? And, and the beauty of 1 John 1, 9 is this. It says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we'll own our sin and confess our sin, God will happily forgive us that sin. We don't have to live in that perpetual shame and that guilt. 
And having confessed that sin to God, there may be some sins we need to confess to each other, right? If you have failed as a spouse, if you have failed as a parent, you may need to talk to your spouse. You may need to talk to your kid and say, listen, I failed you as a parent. I failed you as a spouse. Will you forgive me, right? Here's what I did wrong. Will you forgive me for that, right? And, 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 and acknowledge that and own that, right? And having done that, you can then live in the freedom of God's forgiveness and His grace and, and, and at that point, you can say, you know what, I don't need to wallow in my mistakes. I don't need to wallow in the failures of the past, which God has now forgiven. My focus now can be on the future. My focus now can be on, on being the kind of spouse, the kind of parent that I haven't been, right? To whatever opportunity, I still have influence. I'm going to be the kind of godly parent, the kind of godly grandparent, the godly great-grandparent that God wants me to be. I'm going to make a difference from here on out because God has a plan for you. God wants to continue to use you, and there's a fresh start. His mercies are new every morning, and so live the life God called you to. Yes, repent of the past where you need to, but move forward and experience His grace and His forgiveness in the power. Let me also speak to those of us that maybe grew up in that dysfunctional family. It will be tempting for some of us to play the blame blame game, to point fingers at mom and dad and brothers and sisters and uncles and aunts and say, they're the reason my life is so messed up. And you know what? There may be some truth in that right? They may well have contributed to some of the challenges that you're now experiencing in life, but we have a choice. We do. We have a choice. We can spend all our time blaming people for the mess we're in, or we can decide to accept personal responsibility from this point going forward and, and do something good about it. You can dwell on your problems, or you can focus on solutions. You can focus on the past, or you can pursue the wonderful future that your loving father has for you, and he does have a wonderful future for you. He does. Joseph could have easily chosen to play the blame game, but instead, understanding that God had called him to a noble task, he set aside his past, he took personal responsibility for his decisions, and he pressed ahead for God, and God used him greatly. Joseph rose above his dysfunctional family, and guess what? So can we. Listen, resist the temptation to look wistfully at other families or other married couples and go, oh, if only I had a spouse like that or, or a parent like that. If only I could have grown up in that family, my life would be so much better. Don't let your head go there because I have a little secret for you. The truth is every family, every marriage is dysfunctional. It is. You know why I can say that? Because every individual is dysfunctional. Do you know why? Because every individual is a sinner. Listen, today I've been speaking in terms of dysfunction, but that's a, that's a psychological term, that's a sociological term, that's a cultural term, but theologians have their own term for that, right? Dysfunction means something's not functioning properly. Theologians have another term, it's not dysfunction, it's depravity, right? And it describes the very same thing. The fact that within each of us there's something wrong, there's something that's not operating, functioning correctly, and the Bible gives an answer as to why we experience that dysfunction, it goes all the way back to the beginning of the story. When God and man were, work, were, were walking together in perfect harmony in the Garden of Eden, right? Life was functioning as it was supposed to. God and man, man and nature living in harmony. It was the ideal paradise. But then Adam and Eve made that fateful decision to rebel against God. And they were expelled from his presence. They were expelled from his life-giving power and strength and resource. And the moment they were expelled from his presence, so too were we right? And from that point forward, something within our nature has been corrupted, right? We've been cut off from the one true source of meaning and purpose and joy, and, and we, we don't function right, right? That's why we were now perpetually drawn to self-destructive behaviors and selfish behaviors, and we struggle with temptation. So it's because there's something now within us that isn't operating correctly. It's that sin nature that we inherited from Adam and Eve. And our only hope right, to overcome that is to, is to reconnect with our Creator, to reconnect to the one true source of meaning and power and strength and joy. And that's the benefit of, of coming to Christ and engaging Him by faith, is, is we reconnect with our Creator in a meaningful, intimate, personal relationship where we receive His forgiveness and we begin to receive His power, where the Spirit of the risen Christ comes within us and begins slowly but surely reversing the effects of the fall. We're slowly but surely, as we walk with Him and we find our strength in Him, we become less and less like our corrupt, sinful self and more and more like Jesus, right? And, and that's the beauty of having a relationship with Jesus Christ. The only way to overcome our dysfunction is through that personal relationship with the living God who made us, who knows how we're supposed to function, and who wants to teach us and empower us to live that deeply satisfying life that He created us for. Do you have a relationship with God? 
Are you connected in a meaningful way to your Creator? Not just as your Creator, but as your Father, as your friend? You see, when we give our lives to Jesus Christ, when we place our faith in Him, something amazing happens, right? Uh, a, a change of relationship happens. Not only are we you know, like criminals before a judge or creatures before a Creator, but God embraces us as children before a loving Heavenly Father. And, and, and in that moment that we place our faith in Christ, he, he grants us forgiveness and hope and life, and He becomes the Father that maybe you never had. There's a Spanish story of a father and son who had become estranged. Uh, the son ran away, and the father set off to find him. He searched for months to no avail. Finally, in a desperate last effort to find him, the father put an ad in a Madrid newspaper, and this is what it read, quote, Dear Paco, meet me in front of this newspaper office at noon on Saturday. All is forgiven. I love you, your father. That Saturday, 800 Pacos showed up looking for forgiveness and love from their fathers. You may not have had the father you wished you'd had. You may not have had the family that you wish you could have had. You've maybe never experienced the consistent love and leadership of a father on earth who cares for you deeply. Well, guess what? I'm here to tell you this morning. God desperately longs to be for you, the father that you never had. Will you let him? Will you receive him? Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for its practicality and uh, how you provide really tremendous hope and resources for how to navigate life in a difficult, fallen, dysfunctional world. And Lord, I pray that this morning you've used something from your word to provide encouragement and hope for us. Um, help us as, as members of Cornerstone, as, as families within this church, uh, to become the kind of healthy families that would be attractive to an onlooking world, that we would be evidence that your Holy Spirit, the, the Spirit of the risen Christ, can genuinely do a work in our hearts and in our families to reflect something of the love and kindness that you've shown to us, even in the way we relate to one another as families. So Lord, help us as children, as siblings, as fathers to, um, to work in your strength to become the people you've called us to be, uh, to be the families you've called us to be. And we pray today that if there's anyone here today who's never yet uh, come to know you as their loving Heavenly Father, that they may do that by faith. In Jesus' name, amen.